To go quickly, I'm not going to do like last time to recapitulate what we did. So please do keep in touch with what we read and do in class. Now today for today's lecture, I'm going to speak about the following points. Okay, I will speak about how these concepts are dealt with within the framework of social linguistics. Okay, so we will talk about language. Dialect, the vernaculars, lingua franca. And we will try to see the differences between all these, the criteria on which we can rely so as to okay, characterize each concept there. Language, dialects, vernaculars, lingua. Sorry, there is a mistake there. Lingua franca. Now, let's have a... Okay, so let's try to do some kind of uh, description of our context, Morocco, and try to figure out the languages we have and the dialects, vernaculars, or any lingua franca. Can you try to characterize, describe our speech community? I'm using the terminology of social linguistics. And the languages, the dialects, vernaculars, and lingua franca used in our context. Yes? So, just think again, as I, we did last time, think about what we do when we go to different domains, when we are in different contexts, when we are performing different functions, right? Try to think about what kind of languages we have, dialects, vernaculars, languages. Now let's start with the first one, languages. So how many languages do we have? How many languages do we have? We have, of course, languages. Yeah, what are they? No, don't tell me three, four, or five. What are they? Just tell me what are they. Standard Arabic. Okay. Amazigh. Amazigh. Because we need to make a difference between Amazigh and Tamazigh. Okay? So Amazigh. And there is a question mark there. We will try to discuss the issue related to Amazigh. So we are talking about Standard Arabic, Amazigh. But what are the languages do we have? Foreign languages, we have French, Spanish, English, okay, and some German, some other languages. So those are the languages we have, okay, in relation to our context. Then we have dialects or vernaculars. The dialects or vernaculars, so we have, uh, okay, Tamazir, yes, Tarifid and Tashikhid in relation to Amazigh language. Okay, and then if we go to Arabic, we have, yes, there is a dialectal Arabic, which we call Moroccan Arabic, okay? Now, in Moroccan Arabic, do we have just one Moroccan Arabic? Or we have different types of Moroccan Arabic? Yes. Yes, so depending on what? What variable? The region. So depending on the region where that dialect is spoken, we have a specific kind of dialect with some minor differences between that dialect and another dialect spoken in another region. For example, in the region of Fas, we have Fasi dialect. And then, Kazawi dialect in the region of Casablanca, then Marachi. Okay? And then, if we go to the south, from Agadir, we have the Sahara, we have Hassaniya, which we shouldn't forget. So, you know, our <laughs> student groups. Okay, we have to make a kind of fair description between whatever exists in our context, especially that I'm recording this. So Mr. Tamer is not talking about us. We should do something about him. So that's, uh, okay, that's, uh, uh, those are the dialects. Okay, we have Moroccan Arabic as a dialect. 
And we are, this Moroccan Arabic has got different dialects or vernaculars, okay, spoken in different regions. And there are some minor differences which are usually due. What kind of differences do we have? Like, between, for example, Fasi and Kazawi? The most, yes. In the accent. So, in the accent. This is another term which we will try to see language, dialects, vernaculars, accents as well. I'm going to add it there. Accents. So we have accents between different types of vernaculars. Now, for example, what is the main difference, for example, between the Farsi and the Kazawi? Uh, there is a one sound which is the A, okay, or A, okay, in Farsi dialect it's pronounced like A, and, okay, and in uh, in uh, Arabic, in Kazawi or whatever, it is spoken like Ga, Gelli, okay, so those are some of the differences, yes, please. And the Ra as well, yes, the Ra, the pronunciation of the Ra is different, Farsi they pronounce like Ra, you know, and then we have the Kazawi, the normal, okay, Kind of. So those are related to accents, pronunciation, phonology. Okay, phonology. So these are some of the some of the things we try to talk about during our lecture, and we'll try to uh, see the kind of criteria used to differentiate between okay uh, language and the dialect and the vernacular and other okay concepts. I'm going to give you kind of, uh, let's go now back, uh, go out of our context. I'm going to refer to another context with Chinese context, okay, in order to make it, you know, kind of uh, uh, comparison between different types of context. Chinese context will not be the only one I'm going to refer to here. I'm going to refer to other contexts like Greece, like France, okay, where we will see how these concepts have been dealt with. Okay, sociolinguistically socio speaking. You have this kind of text. I give you some time to read it, okay, and try to figure out the concepts, okay, the main concepts there. So what can you say about this context here, uh, about the developments that have taken place? In the beginning, so in ancient history, what was the case in ancient history for China? What were, the, what were they using in order to communicate? Yes, Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yes, so we, there were many dialects spoken in China in ancient history. A variety, a wide variety of dialects. Okay? And then, at a certain point in time afterwards, there was a kind of development, especially in the 20th century. What happened in the 20th century? What happened in the 20th century? Yes, the Beijing dialect. What happened to the Beijing dialect? Yes, it was. Did we make this on the 
okay? It would be much more, much more civilized if we do it this way. If you have a nice just so you can have it. Yes, we count a national language it was chosen, and then it became a national language. Now, a little bit before this, okay, they were in the 17th century, what happened? There was something that took place in the early 17th century. Efforts were made to do what? Yes, standardization. So there was something that happened before, that is the standardization of the pronunciation. Okay, but it was somehow limited. And then after this, they chose the Beijing dialect that they have opted for to become the national language for the constitution, for the parliament, like our national language, which is standard Arabic. Uh, okay, it was the official, it became the official uh, language of mainland uh, China. And then we also need to refer to something here, which is uh, the standardization. Because when we want, when a community, they need a, a kind of national language they want to choose, they just don't choose it like that and keep it that way, the same way it is. There is some kind of standardization that takes place. Okay? That takes place when, in order to develop the dialect further, and then make it the national language. And then, in addition to this, because you know, afterward, Hong Kong became, it was uh, colonized, and then it was returned to homeland China. Okay? Independence. But the situation in Hong Kong is a bit different, okay? Uh, in relation to mainland, okay, China. So let's uh, I show you now uh, another slide where we have some of the main concepts that we will try to deal with. So we have there kinds of concepts, and that's what we try to deal with in today's lecture. So there is the concept of language, dialect, standardized, national language, official language, Standard, okay, standard Cantonese, okay, uh, here it refers to the same phenomenon of standardization. So we will see what it means exactly. Now, the kinds of topics we will cover, they are as follows. So we will cover the concepts or the topics of language, as we have seen in the example there in that text. Dialect, accent, and of course, we are not going uh, to. We are going to refer to our context, of course, to our speech community, okay, in order to describe these concepts. And we will be comparing between ours and other contexts. Other topics will be standard languages and standardization, because every speech community, mostly every speech community, should have a kind of standard language which is chosen uh, to be the national official language. So this kind of standard language, it used to be like a kind of dialect. Then this dialect was standardized, so we'll see what we, they do in order to standardize the dialect to become a standard language. Official languages, we'll see that as well. Vernacular languages, the vernaculars, Lingua franca or lingua franca as well. By the way, uh, since you are taking notes, I have already posted for you in the blog the PDF versions of all the lectures we have gone through so far. And not in Facebook, but in this blog. If you go here, you can see that there is 
sociolinguistics there as a page. You click on it and you will have the videos as well as the PDF versions of all the lectures. You can download them and then print them if you want. So that I'm telling you this so that you don't worry. So we'll have everything PDF format. Okay? And then also we will deal we will try to see the implications for all that for education. <coughs> what all these concepts imply for education. Now, languages and dialects. What do you think could be the differences between languages and dialects? Hopefully, I, I'm being optimistic that you have read a bit of this. So, languages and dialects. How do sociolinguists distinguish between these two concepts? How could we distinguish between languages and dialects? Yes, sir? Yes. Yes. Linguistics. Yes. Yes. Right. So you are referring here to two uh, criteria. The first one is function, formal versus informal functions. And the second one you are referring to is linguistic, in terms of grammar. That's what you said, right? Okay, fine. Any others? Yes, sir. Yes, languages, they are written. Spoken forms. Okay, yes. So here you are referring to mode. You remember in first lecture we talked about this concept? Modes of discourse. Written mode and then oral mode or communication. So languages you are saying that they are written, while dialects usually they are okay, spoken, oral. Yes? Languages almost have literary pages, while actually dialects has of yes, so here you are referring to a concept of literary heritage, which shows that you have read a little bit. Literary heritage. This is one of the criteria used to distinguish between okay, uh, languages and dialects. What does this mean, literary heritage? I mean, kind of novels. Yes. Yeah. Which one has got literary heritage more? <laughs> languages. <laughs> so, it is said that languages have more literary heritage than dialects. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Another? Other information? Yes? You can say also that dialect is more popular than language. Sure. More maybe you mean popular, but you mean widely, more widely used. That's what you mean, right, maybe, because we're most, more widely used at home, in cafes, in the streets, everyday life communication. While languages are used only for formal contexts in TV, parliament, education. Yeah, maybe in that case, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that dialect is just a way of articulation. But language is, uh, it has uh, dictionary and it's more teachable. Yes, so it is codified, standardized. So we will see these concepts. Languages are standardized dialects, so they have, they are codified, they have codif codification, have gone through some codification in the sense that they have grammar books, okay, uh, etc., and rules and so on. Now let's move on. So the first one, okay, so we have classical Arabic, standard Arabic. These are examples of languages, right? Yeah, in the past it used to be called classical Arabic. 
remember the days of Quraysh, so we used to have these kinds of things called Mu'allaqat, and the type of Arabic that was spoken at that time, the language, is somehow different from the one we have nowadays. Nowadays we call it standard Arabic, because it has been, it has new vocabulary, you know, depending on the concept, the new concepts we have. So there is some little uh, difference between the two. But they are the same language. So, and Max Van Reich, he says that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, somehow, okay? An army and navy, these two terms to refer to the codification, standardization, literary heritage, books, etc. Functions, formal uh, context. So all that is, could be considered as the army and the navy of uh, language. So, a language is a dialect, it used to be a kind of dialect, and then it was developed, okay, to become a kind of language. The language dialect distinction is political, sociological, as much as linguistic. It's political and sociological as much as linguistic. We're going to see that, yes, sociolinguists have tried to come up with some criteria in order to distinguish between language and a dialect, and we're going to see them. There are two, in addition to some of the ones you have said. The yeah, first one is mutual intelligibility. We're going to see it in a few uh, moments. And the second one is the one you have mentioned, literary heritage. But, as we're going to see, these two concepts or these two criteria are not enough, okay, they are relative. They can't alone help to make the distinction between language and a dialect clear. And usually, this distinction has got some sociological, political, sociopolitical reasons, apart from mutual intelligibility apart from literary heritage. And we will see how. As examples for the, for the time being, you know that there used to be what we call farmer Yugoslavia. In the past, there used to be this kind of Yugoslavia, and it used to have or to include a lot of ethnic people, ethnicities, Serbians, Croatians, etc. But then at some point in time, there were clashes, okay? And then Yugoslavia farming, you, now they're separated. You have Croatia and then you have uh, other, uh, each one has got its own country. Now, for in the past, in the former Yugoslavia, they used to have one language, like Serbian, Croatian. Okay? But then when they were separated after the clashes, each one of them adopted its own language. So Croatia used Croatian and Yugoslavia Serbian. Now you can see that the reasons here, the main reason, have nothing to do with mutual intelligibility or literary heritage or standardization or function or whatever. It is used mainly due to political, sociological reasons, okay? Sociopolitical reasons uh, that uh, lead to, the, uh, to that uh, kind of distinction between the two. Arabic example two, or the Arab world, for instance, if we go to our context, we have standard Arabic. Standard Arabic, okay? It was, it is, it was adopted. Yes, please. Which criteria Yeah, political. So I'm talking in general terms. You got political reasons, you know, political reasons, or sociological reasons, or whatever. Now, for our context, we have standard Arabic. Now, it became the source of the main national language for all Arab nations. Why? Because it is the language of the Quran, and uh, uh, it has got literary heritage, etc., etc. And we're going to see, for example, if we talk about our country, or the Maghreb in general, okay, after independence, before independence, French had a strong uh, existence, you know, uh, presence 
in uh, all spheres of life, okay, in, especially in business, education, etc. But then, after independence, there was the, yeah, let's reject Arabization. You have heard about the Arabization process. After independence, they started the Arabization process. And why? Because they want to reject French and adopt standard Arabic. So you see here that the reasons are sociological. Okay? They have nothing to do, uh, yes, there is something related to literary history, etc., but it's mainly sociological, political. Now, criteria for distinction, we have mentioned that in the literature there is this first one, which is called mutual intelligibility. It means that, yes, anybody who can tell us uh, an idea about that? What does it mean in mutual intelligibility? Yes? Mutual intelligibility. Anybody? Let's talk about this example of uh, Tamazir and okay, Tarifi, for example. And Tashrikit as well, for people who are okay. So, between Tashrikit and Tamazir, people, when they are speaking in these two varieties, they can understand each other. Mutual intelligibility. But when the Tamazir, or they speak Tamazir and Tarifit, there is no understanding. Yes? And that's mutual and intelligibility. Mutual and intelligibility. Okay? So, this is the meaning of, what, uh, of this criteria. Mutual intelligibility, when they speak two different dialects or uh, okay, varieties, you understand each other, so it means there is mutual intelligibility. Okay? Mutual understanding. But when you speak two varieties and you don't understand each other, we are talking about mutual and intelligibility. So this criterion has been adopted in order to distinguish between language and dialects. So they tell you if two dialects or if two varieties, two dialectal varieties are used and there is mutual intelligibility between them, they are dialects. Okay? But when two dialect varieties are spoken, or two varieties are spoken, and there is no understanding between the two, uh, two, two dialects or two, two varieties, they are called different languages. Two mutually unintelligible, difficult word there, varieties are generally regarded as different languages. That's the criteria. When you have two varieties spoken, and these two people don't understand each other, you can talk about different languages in them. But if you have people speaking two varieties, but still they can understand each other, we are speaking about just two dialects. Okay? So this is the first criterion, mutual intelligibility. But again, as I have mentioned before, this criterion is relative. It's not strong enough because there are some exceptional cases where it doesn't uh, justify this distinction between language and dialect. It is, however, relative since two varieties of English, there are some two varieties of English, one is called New York English and the other one is called Cockney English, but these two there is mutual and intelligibility. When the two people are speaking these two English varieties, they don't understand each other. Normally, according to this criterion, we should consider them as two different languages. But they don't. They just consider them as dialects. Which means that this concept or criterion is relative. It's not strong enough. It is relative. It doesn't explain all distinctions existing but they are not considered 
independent languages. They are just considered as dialects. Another example of this relativity of this concept from our Arab context, you know that we Moroccans, when we are listening and, uh, to uh, Iraqi series, you don't understand. You don't understand. Especially if, if you meet the guy. Especially if you meet the guy, there is some kind of mutual unintelligibility. You can understand a few words. Some Somewhat. But it's not total, okay? There is some kind of mutual unintelligibility. That's the case for uh, movies or for TV. Yes, you can understand. But if you meet the people in the street, there is difficulty to understand them. There is mutual and intelligibility. But still, <coughs> they are not considered as two different languages. They are just considered as two different dialects. Moroccan Arabic as a dialect and Iraqi Arabic as a dialect. And both of us, we share one language, which is standard Arabic. Another example could be the one that we have in our Moroccan context, in particular, the one related to Tanazir and Tarifit. So we have said that there is mutual and intelligibility between these two dialects, but are they considered as two different languages? No. They are not considered as two different, they are just considered as two dialects of the same language, which is Amazir. Okay, so you hate to hear the word Berber. I'm not using the word Berber, so Amazir. Make a distinction between Amazir and Tamazir. So make a distinction, distinction, please. You have Amazir as a language, and now it is being codified, you know, a grammar, etc. And then there is Tamazir. So between Tamazir and Tarifit, there is mutual and intelligibility but they are not considered as two separate independent languages. They are just considered as two dialects of the same Amazigh language. Okay? So that's another example for you. So which means that this concept or this criterion of mutual, and intelli or mutual intelligibility is relative. It explains the distinction between languages and dialects somehow, but not for all cases. There are some cases when, uh, when it is not applicable. <coughs> there are degrees, we, in this case, we can talk about what is uh, referred to as degrees of mutual intelligibility. And it doesn't always help distinguish between a dialect and a language. So it is relative. Okay? It's not strong enough. And that's why the main criteria for distinguishing between language and dialect have to do with sociological, political, sociopolitical reasons. Okay? Rather than mutual intelligibility or literary heritage. The other criterion is literary heritage or possession of literature. It means simply that the language, as you have explained, has got stronger okay, literary heritage, written literary heritage. Lot of novels, lot of books, lot of poetry, okay? in the language, like in standard Arabic. A language must have its own legacy and literature. But still, as a criterion again, it is not enough. It is, however, not enough. It is inadequate, not strong enough, like the criterion of mutual intelligibility. Why? Because even dialects do have some literary 
legacy, literary heritage. It could also be even written literary heritage in some areas, some context. Which means that it's not enough as a criterion to distinguish between a language. You say a language has got literary heritage, possession of literature, where a dialect doesn't have. Do you think that Tamazib doesn't have a literary heritage? It does have, for example, take the, take the example of Ahwash, for example. Ahwash, you know Ahwash? Yeah. No group of musicians. They use poetry. They use poetry when they are singing, they are using poetry, good poetry. Okay, uh, not very good in speaking and understanding Amazigh, but I do. Okay, and I have people explaining things for me. They do use some poetry there. Use poetry, good poetry. There are even poets. Okay, Amazigh poets. Okay, but the problem is that usually it's oral Akwash. It's oral. Okay, it's not written. Right? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So, so anyway. Don't take me. Don't take me into uh, into details of Amazigh because I'm not very strong into Amazigh. I know a bit, but uh, not a lot. Okay, because I'm not uh, originally Amazigh. Okay. Um, uh, now, all varieties have some kind of literature, be it oral or written. This is the exception. This is the reason why this criterion of possession of literature is inadequate, is not strong enough. Because all varieties, dialects included, they have some kind of literature, be it oral or written or sometimes both. No, that's me. Can you help me please put this, plug it in there? My battery was about to die, and then I'm not going to record this, so I had to uh, plug in uh, the charger. So these two criteria, mutual intelligibility versus mutual and intelligibility, not enough, and then possession of literature, it's also not strong enough, <coughs> because there are always exceptions. There is also some... Uh, Distinction that is due to linguistics, okay? Linguistic criteria. In the sense that, okay, language, uh, in terms of phonology, uh, syntax, etc. Differences between languages and dialects exist at the phonological, lexical, morphological, and semantic levels. Take the case of standard Arabic and compare it with Moroccan Arabic. Usually, if you just take one example, the case of uh, the, the, the point related to case marking. Yeah, a lot. Case marking in standard Arabic. We have a lot in standard Arabic, but we don't have it in Moroccan Arabic. So that's kind of, this is also linguistic criterion can also serve as a way to distinguish between languages and dialects. It is said that languages have a little bit complex kind of uh, grammar, phonology, etc. Where our dialects have, have, have some kind of simplified grammar, okay, phonology, and so on and so forth. But still, it's not the main reason, the main 
criterion to use to distinguish between dialects and languages. Because as, said, as I said in the beginning, the main reason is sociological, okay, political, sociopolitical, rather than linguistic or literary heritage or uh, mutual intelligibility. That is it, okay? The language dialect distinction is political, sociological, sociopolitical more than linguistic. The opposition, as it is stated in uh, the following reference, Atkinson et al., 1982, the opposition between language and dialects bears on prestige. This is one of the main reasons to distinguish between language and dialect. Usually, if you think about standard Arabic, so regarded as more prestigious than Moroccan Arabic. So it has to do with prestige, and usually associated with political or ethnic affirmation. Okay, ethnic affirmation. For example, in some contexts, you can have like uh, groups, different ethnic uh, groups. But one of the ethnic groups is stronger, richer, and powerful more than the others. Usually, they adopt the dialect of that group in order to make it the official language of the whole group. Okay? That's why the reasons have to do with sociological factors, political factors, sociopolitical variables, rather than linguistic variables. <coughs> well, for example, I give you the example of one country that we know about too much and to which we are linked a lot is the friends, for instance. Friends, if you go to history, like Chinese history, what happened, uh, they used to have dialects. They didn't have language as a national language. Okay? Now what happened is that the dialects spoken in Paris, the dialect spoken in Paris, the people speaking it were stronger, etc. Because Paris, it was the capital of the main city in the country. So there were groups living in there, especially the educated ones, the lawyers and scientists and the, the poets, etc. So they were strong in the country, they have their influence. So what happened is that they have chosen the dialect of Paris to become the national official language of the whole country. So this means and shows that the reasons are not really linguistic to distinguish between a dialect and a language. It's usually related to sociological, political, sociopolitical, okay, and sometimes ethnic, okay, uh, variables. Okay. Now, we have already seen that example for former Yugoslavia, and then how they have, uh, what happened. Another example is Greece. In Greece, also, they have chosen one dialect in there, which was stronger in terms of the group speaking it, and so, and other, and so on and so forth. It was called Demotiki, and this was... Be, this became the national official language for Greece, okay? And now what you call now Greek, uh, Greek, okay, Greece, and then Greek, okay? Greek as a language, okay? Again, in India, the same thing happened. They used to have dialects, and then they have opted for the stronger dialect in terms of the people speaking it, which was called then Hindi, and then it was uh, chosen to become the national official language. It was given the status of a national official language after independence. After independence, that's what they did. So, okay. Another example for the Maghreb, because before independence, there, were, there used to be a strong presence of French in different uh, spheres of life of our country, our, our speech community. But then after independence, what happened is that there was the Arabization process whereby they tried to replace, and which they did in fact, uh, 
French, okay, using standard Arabic as a means of education, as a means for business, as a means for uh, all aspects of formal, uh, formal uh, context. So French has been gradually replaced by standard Arabic after independence, and the Arabization process is still going on because it has it has witnessed some difficulties. For example, one of the difficulties that uh, the students and the, and the faculty of biology, or the no, faculty of science, suffer from. You know that they study uh, biology, physics, in Arabic up to baccalaureate level, but then. When they go to the faculty of science, everything is in French. So, they, so that's a kind of shows that this Arabization process started at the primary level, middle school level, high school level for subjects that used to be taught in French. They started to be taught in Arabic, send Arabic, but they stopped. They didn't go further into university level to start Arabizing okay, the uh, scientific disciplines. So that's one of the difficulties that this process is uh, going through. But still, uh, uh, Arabization has taken place uh, somehow widely. So for religious, <coughs> after independence, for religious, historical, political reasons, Standard Arabic, the language of the Quran, the Holy Quran, was chosen as the official language of the Maghreb countries because it is unlike dialects, codified, and it is the vehicle of a great spiritual and literary heritage. So, you have more than just literary heritage and mutual intelligence. There are other variables related to politics and sociological factors, religious factors as well involved in that. So you have there how many variables there, how many criteria? So we have language of the Quran, religious variable, uh, official language of the country because uh, it is codified, somehow linguistic, uh, spiritual, literary heritage, so a lot of different variables, not only linguistic variables. have the copy of this later on, online. <coughs> now, as, I'm, as a way to define, as a way of defining this concept, we can say that language is a collection of dialects, okay, it's a collection of dialects, it includes many dialects, while a dialect is a particular variety of a language. Dialect is a particular variety of language, like if you say Moroccan Arabic, Tunisian Arabic, or Libyan. It's one particular variety of language that differs noticeably from the variety or varieties of the same language spoken by another group or groups of people. If you take, for instance, like Moroccan Arabic and compare it to Saudi Arabic, compare it to Iraqi Arabic, or compare it to Egyptian Arabic, there are some differences between all these dialects okay, uh, among each other.
I think it will be long if we uh, dialects and accents now. So dialects are variations in pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. Accents are variations in pronunciation only. When you talk about different dialects, you have very differences in all levels, in all linguistic levels, in semantics, in uh, phonology, in syntax, in uh, morphology, okay? But when you talk about accents, you have only phonological, phonetic, or phonological, okay, uh, uh, variation uh, uh, mainly related to pronunciation. <coughs> when you talk about accents, you are talking about mainly pronunciation. You can have different accents. So that's why when you are listening to somebody, okay, when you are traveling, especially when you are traveling and you are meeting people from different places, you can determine, you can guess where the person is just on the basis of the accent. For example, if you hear somebody telling you a link, okay, so it means that he's coming from a vast area. Right? Because the pronunciation there is different from the one I use. And then if you say for someone get link or Okay, so the pronunciation, okay, so pronunciation is the main aspect there uh, related to accents. While dialects, it's related to variations in pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. All linguistic levels. As a final note, as a final note related to accent, we all have one. There is so much, no such thing as a person who speaks without accent. Everyone has got an accent. Okay? This is not an exercise in political correctness, by the way. It is a fact. So you can have some global accent related to region, like Farsi, Marakshi, etc. But still, in terms, individual terms, each one of Mangas has got his own kind of accent. And this uh, one, <coughs> called dialectal continuum, it's somehow related to uh, the criterion of okay is somehow related to the criterion of mutual intelligibility okay like if you say uh, let me give you the following for as an example what is it <coughs> yes here it is for standard Arabic for example that's the language and then you can have all these different dialects. And if you go from Moroccan Arabic to Algerian Arabic, Tunisian Arabic, Libyan Arabic, Egyptian Arabic, Standard Arabic, Iraqi Arabic, you can feel that the continuum, there is some kind of, yes please. You can feel that there is some kind of continuum. Now, our neighbors, we can understand each other, Algerians, Tunisians. But the further you go, the continuum, okay, there is, it's reducing, it's decreasing. That's why we are moving forward towards mutual and intelligibility. When we go, for example, to Iraqi Arabic, which is at the other end of this uh, example here. So that's what we mean by dialectal continuum. It is related to the issue of mutual intelligibility, understanding, how much you can understand Okay, another dialect or variety. You can uh, compare dialectal one or dialect one to Moroccan Arabic, dialect two as Algerian Arabic, dialect three. So the further you go, the continuum, okay, the mutual or the understanding reduces and decreases. Now, we have to talk about another issue, which is standardization and standard language as another cons other concepts.
Every country needs a national language, national official language. And the variables that play a role in this kind of uh, choosing a national language is the one called standardization. Okay? And the language or the dialect that you can choose to be standardized is the more prestigious one. So we have what leads to standardization of language use in a community. We have prestige, codification, high functions. Now, this is the meaning of standardization. You take a dialect that is prestigious, and then this dialect that is prestigious, you codify it in the sense that you create books, okay, you use it for printing books, novels, poems, also you can use it for, uh, you can uh, describe its grammar, its phonology, its syntax, and so on and so forth. The other thing is related to functions. This dialect, you are trying to elevate it in the sense that it will, it will not be used only for everyday life communication, for intimate functions, informal functions, they try to use it in other formal functions. So they start using it in TV, for instance, they start using it in education, they start using it in uh, parliament, all types of formal contexts, where it used not to be spoken before, when it was just a dialect. So when we talk about standardization, we have to remember these concepts. Prestige, codification, and high functions. We choose the dialect, and we try to use it not only in informal communication, informal context, but we try to spread it in all formal domains, all formal contexts. The main one is education. They start using it as a language of education. They start using it as a language to teach all subjects. Right? While before, when it used to be only a dialect, it used only to be spoken at home, in cafes, and so on. But when it's becoming standardized, part of the standardization process is to elevate its power, its prestige, its functions, and use it further beyond the four informal domains, the informal context, start using it for high functions, education, as I have explained. Of course, when you codify it, it starts to be written, okay, more than it used to be. <laughs> and also, the country starts a process whereby it tries to convince all other people or other groups that this is our, okay, national language. So the two here you have are related to codification. Except the written variety, they start using it for writing, for printing books, etc. Okay. And then, uh, development of accepted vocabulary. Of course, when they are going to start using it in high functions, in formal context, of course, the vocabulary of that dialect needs to be developed. Okay? Because when you use it just for informal communication, for at home, for... Okay? You have vocabulary for that context. But then when you take it for teaching like biology, for teaching uh, physics, you have to develop its vocabulary, right? That's part of codification.
So, after all this, after all what we have presented, we need to be careful about not falling into a kind of misconception. Yes, please? We need to be careful not to fall into a kind of misconception. Usually, some people might think that okay, uh, dialects are inferior to languages, and languages are superior to dialects. This is a misconception, okay? The difference between a language and a standard language and a dialect has nothing to do with this inferiority, superiority. Powerful, yes. Uh, in, just take into account the language itself. Forget about sociopolitical, uh, sociological, political reasons, okay? Or religious regions. Forget about all those variables. Just focus on the language and the dialect, linguistically speaking. The distinction between these two doesn't mean that the dialects, linguistically speaking, are inferior to languages and vice versa, that languages are superior to dialects. This is a misconception, okay? No language or dialect or accent is superior to any other. But all varieties are inappropriate at times. There is only this issue of function and inappropriateness or appropriateness in the sense that the low varieties you need to use them only in informal context while we can't use them in formal context whereas the formal varieties or the high varieties we can use them only for formal context we can't use them for example at home do you use standard Arabic at home? no that's what we mean by inappropriateness or appropriateness. So the difference between the language and the dialect is related to this. It has nothing to, to, to mean that it is superior or inferior. Emergence of a standard variety is a historical accident. Okay, let's take the example of French for instance. After, okay, at some point in time, they decided, yeah, let's, we want a national language. What is the one we're going to choose? It is the one that is strong, so let's choose it, standardize it, codify it, and make it our national language. Okay? The same thing for Hindi, Hindi, for instance. For India, after independence, they have chosen Hindi, Okay? to become the national language. So that's what we mean here by emergence of a standard variety is a historical incident. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, there is a problem. Yes? Again, uh, when I'm explaining and then some people are listening, it disturbs me. I have to speak, I, I, automatically I tell myself, speak louder. Okay, I'm only speaking louder and I can't speak louder than this. So please, can you help? While I'm listening, while I'm speaking, can you help me? Okay. Or you as well. And just listen. After you go out, you can talk as much as you can. Okay? Because I want to keep my voice, right? Okay, I'm a human being. Okay, if you continue, and I have lots of groups, you know? If I continue this, uh, at some point in time, so, yeah. <coughs> so the languages have various dialects <coughs> so as I said the difference between language and dialect has, doesn't mean superiority or inferiority. That's the wrong view. That's a misconception. Right? What you need to, to, to take into account as the appropriate view, okay, as the appropriate 
standing point is that languages have various dialects. The standard language is associated more with prestige, which is a non-linguistic okay, variable. What is considered standard has nothing to do with correctness or superiority. It doesn't mean that a language is more correct than a dialect. It doesn't mean that standard Arabic is more correct than Moroccan Arabic. Both of them are correct. So the distinction between the two, the languages and the dialects, go beyond linguistic variables. Okay? They go beyond linguistic variables into other variables related to society, sociological, political, sociopolitical, religious, and uh, functions, <laughs> etc. For example, here, we have the notion of prestige related to standard languages, and here also, uh, from a linguistic standpoint, all di dialects are equally correct, equally expressive, equally logical, and so on and so forth. That is, the term non-standard dialects means just that not the standard dialects. It is, doesn't mean inferior or substandard. So the purpose of these arguments here is to help you not adopt a misconception. What is the misconception? Maybe you can think that a language is superior than a dialect. A language is more correct than a dialect, or vice versa. That's a misconception. Don't take it into account. Forget about it. Okay? The distinction between the two goes beyond linguistic variable and to okay, other variables related to society and politics. Okay, we go on. So this is a kind of... Uh, sometimes uh, re ideas are repeated. So we don't need to take uh, notes for this one. I just need to repeat and repeat for you to understand. Okay? So what is standard is not a matter of better from a linguistic point of view. Superior, inferior more correct, less correct, better, worse. What is the standard is dictated by attitudes in the society towards particular groups of people who speak in particular ways. And here, take the example of the dialect of French. Of French. What did I say about this context? He said that at some point in time, there was no national language called French. There were dialects spoken by the French people. And then at some point in time, they wanted to adopt a national language. So what happened is that they chose the dialect of Paris. And they chose the dialect of Paris. Why? Not because the dialect of Paris is uh, more correct, is uh, better, is uh, uh, superior. Yeah, superior, not linguistically, superior in other ways. By the people. The people who were you speaking that dialect were stronger in terms of uh, their economics, in terms of their businesses, in terms of their literature, in terms of and all sociological variables there, political variables in their ethnic variables there as well. So, this is the point here, okay? So, the distinction between languages and dialects has to do with sociological, sociopolitical reasons, religious, ethnic reasons. Now, the distinction between national and official language. So, for instance, our context, the national official language, is both of them at the same time, is standard Arabic. It is our national language, and it is the official 
language. Okay? But then there are some contexts like the one in China, as we're going to see. They have one national official language, and they still have other official languages which are not national, but they are official. Because in China, they have a lot of dialects. Okay? They have a lot of dialects. It's a big country, and they have different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different groups, and sometimes some speech communities there have their own dialects. Okay? So, what happened is that they adopted one dialect to become the national official language for all groups, but at the same time, they adopted some other dialects to become official dialects. Okay? And here we can talk about these two factors here that play a role in determining the national official languages. Usually national official languages, they have what is referred to as the affective referential dimension and the ideological instrumental dimension. In the sense that a national language is the language of political, cultural, and social unit. That's the affective referential dimension. And also, it, an official language is the language for government business, businesses. And that's the meaning of ideological instrumental dimension. Uh, here, we focus on the term instrumental. We use it like an instrument. Okay? So, the national official language is the language of political, cultural, and social units. And this is the meaning of the first dimension there, referred to as affective referential dimension. An official language is also a language for government and business. And this is the meaning of the second dimension there, called ideological instrumental dimension. Because the point of behind adopting a national language, one of the main reasons why we should have a national language is the unity among the different groups in the nation. Right? For example, Morocco, we have different uh, groups. We have Amazigh, we have Sahrawi, we have uh, uh, this and this and this. Now, if we just keep things like that, each one, okay, so there could be some kind of division. But now, thanks to this issue of national official language, what do we do? There is this affect affective referential dimension. It helps create unity, politically speaking, culturally speaking, and sociologically speaking. I think I'm going to skip uh, these uh, examples here. <coughs> now here you have some statistics, okay, in relation to China. How many different languages and how many different dialects there, and so on and so forth. Now let's describe vernaculars, please. Can you help? We still have some little things to finish. Vernacular languages, they are typically not standardized, not really similar to dialects. Typically used at home. <coughs> typically functionally restricted in the sense that they are used for low functions as, uh, mainly. The home, friends, sometimes initial literacy. Typically the first language someone learns typically contrasted with an official high language in that society. These are some of the characteristics of vernacular languages. Or vernaculars.
And then uh, another concept there is lingua francas. Now, lingua francas, lingua francas are used for simply pragmatic reasons. Example, trade, business, lingua francas. We can have different types of lingua francas. It could be an official language, or it could be just a vernacular language used as a lingua franca. Lingua franca sometimes can itself become an official or national language like Swahili. It used to be just a language for doing business, trade, as a lingua franca, but then by the time it was developed to become a national language, official language, Swahili. For our context, usually it is Moroccan Arabic that is the lingua franca. You know, when we have people from different ethnic backgrounds, Amazi or Tarifit or, or whatever, and they are doing business together, so they don't understand their uh, dialects, their corresponding dialects. So what they refer to is they resort to Moroccan Arabic as a lingua franca to do their business. Another example worldwide for a lingua franca is, for instance, English. For people coming from different countries, they don't speak the same language, so they want to do business, and that's what happens. They speak English. It's, become, it's a lingua franca worldwide. 